Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for a special blessing upon the Sabbath day. We thank you for the ability and the freedom to just gather here openly, something perhaps that we take for granted at times. And Lord, we just want to thank you and honor you for all the ways that you bless us. We ask for a special warm embrace around the hearts of those who couldn't join us today. And uh, Lord, we just um, offer this worship service and Sabbath unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. All right. How many of you, by show of hands, can say that there is something, some things, that your parents don't let you have? Yeah? When I was a... uh, that happens sometimes. We'll talk about that. There's probably good reasons for, for most of those. When I was growing up, um, I was fortunate enough to still have my, um, my grandma and grandpa um, on both sides, really. And on my mom's side, my grandma and grandpa, um, they lived quite close to us. And so we saw them quite a bit more often than we did most other relatives. And we absolutely loved them, and, and they loved us. And when I say that, it's like, well, of course they did. They're your grandma and grandpa, right? But they were so sweet. And so loving. And I think one of my favorite things about it is that they, they always saw us as good kids. They'd come over like, oh, there's my big boy, you know, and, and they, they always had it locked in their mind that we probably didn't cause trouble. We were always very good, and they always, they always spoiled us. And uh, so we loved it when Grandma and Grandpa came over, and we especially loved going over to our Grandma and Grandpa's place. And um, my Grandpa, their upbringings back then were a little different. When, if there were some family issues or somebody was struggling maybe with um, alcoholism or something like that, they didn't just, you know, go down to the local clinic and go through a rehab program and, you know, and get restored. They, they handled things in different ways. One example is my grandpa, when he was growing up, he, um, hi, <laughs> he, um, his, his father was alcoholic. I'll make a, a very long story about that very short. His father was alcoholic, and so my grandpa ended up having to help kind of raise the family and make money for the family. And so his upbringing was a little more rough. He was out on his own a lot. He played guitar in, in bars in different yucky places um, to raise money for his, his family and things like that. And he also had to kind of survive a little bit. So he was used to a little bit more adventurous upbringing, if you will. Well, fast forward to um, many years later, as my grandpa, he would come over and he would offer us things. He'd be like, oh, you know what? I've got a really nice dirt bike for you. I'm going to get it all fixed up. And I could see my parents in the background just shaking their head like, oh, boy, they don't need that. You know, or like, don't promise them that unless you're going to, you know, so my eyes would light up and I would get excited about these things. And a couple of things my grandpa brought over one time was like this handmade bow and arrow set. <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, right? These are things that, that I didn't really ever touch or see or have experience with before. And so I was excited too, like, wow, like that's for big people, right? Like it could be like a, like, a, like a grown man and have a bow and arrow and all this neat stuff. And to give you some background, my dad, when he grew up, he wasn't very much an outdoors person. He didn't hunt or fish. And when they went on family family camping trips, he could not stand it. He hated family camping trips. He goes, every time we went, it rained. We'd have three inches of water in our tent we had to dump out. We would get home and have to unpack all this stuff, and we were picking ticks off of each other, and he just hated that. So when we grew up, he wasn't, we weren't doing any of those things because he wasn't interested. And so we didn't have any exposure to that that type of stuff, which was fine. We still had a great life. So my grandpa would bring these things over, um, like hunting, fishing, you know, that type of stuff. And he brought over this bow and arrow one time, and he, and, he, and he just wanted to show us how it worked. And there wasn't like a super strong one, but he took and he shot the arrow in the air straight up, and we just stepped out of the way, and it came down, and I just saw the look on my parents' face, right? And so he left that with us. And as soon as my grandma and grandpa drove off, that went up in the rafters of the garage where I would never touch it again. <laughs> um, he also gave me a nice pocket knife when I was at their house. He's like, he's like, here, you have one of these? I'm like, no, I don't. And he gave it to me. And anything someone gives you is usually precious, right? And here's this pocket knife. I'm like, wow, it folds out my very own pocket knife. I can go outside and cut stuff. And, you know, again, felt like a grown man having this. And I came home I'm like, look, Mom, look what Grandpa gave me. Never saw that again. <laughs> and so you see this pattern, right? And 
I was a little upset, you know, because you, you get excited about stuff and it gets taken away, but I kind of understood it, especially, you know, because we lived in town, so we weren't out in the country, so I didn't really have a place to shoot a bow and arrow. You know, you can't shoot that straight up in the air and expect to be safe all the time. So I understood it, but, you know, so time goes on, and, um, you know, as you grow up, you start to understand those things. Well, I've got a story that I'll finish off with about a friend that I have. His name is Mike. He, uh, he goes to the church I came from back in, in Wisconsin. And uh, Mike's a little bit older. And when he was young, he, was, he lived by some woods. So he had some place to play around and have some of these things. And when he was little, in his house, he had, um, they had a hatchet, this beautiful hatchet. Yeah, another oh, hatchet, yeah. So he had this hatchet. And, and he always wanted, wished he could hold that thing and, and swing it, but he was, he was quite young, you know. But he'd go out in the woods picking around with stuff and, and doing things. And, and, and these days, Mike is big into to hunting and fishing. And um, have you ever heard the, the, the phrase, bury the hatchet? Yeah? Do you know what that means? Like if, if you're having a struggle with someone or two people are having some kind of issue or disagreement, eventually you say, you know what? I think it, let's bury the hatchet on this, you know. And, and it's a way of saying, let's just put that to rest. Let's not chip away or hammer at that anymore, however you want to look at it. But it's a way of saying, let's, let's put that to rest. Let's bury the hatchet on this. And you come to an agreement not to argue anymore. Well, Mike went out to the woods one time. But this time before he went out there, he was able to get his hands on that hatchet. Somebody wasn't watching. Somebody was gone. And he got that hatchet. Now, I got here a little prop. It doesn't look very much like the real thing, but this here is a tree, Okay. So he's got this hatchet. He's been wanting to use this thing forever. I'll bring it down here so everyone can see. There we go. And so he's, he's hacking away. And he's out there trying his new hatchet, you know, and, and chipping away at a, at a tree. Something happened. He missed. That thing slipped. That hatchet dug right into his shin bone on his leg. You can imagine the pain, but think of the predicament he's in now. Predicament is like situation. Think of the situation he's in now. He's got this hatchet stuck in his leg. I think he got it out, obviously, because he's not walking around with it today. But he, he got it out. And so now, who do you tell? You can't tell someone you're using this hatchet. You weren't supposed to have it. But you probably have to go to the hospital because this thing got stuck in your leg. Long story short, he got, he got busted with that, right? He shouldn't have the hatchet. So he got in a bunch of trouble. And I think he learned his lesson. I mean, even if you didn't ground him for a single day, I think, you know, he would come to understand that, um, that he shouldn't have had that hatchet. And those are exactly the reasons why. So sometimes we learn the hard way. I didn't learn the hard way on any of those things that were taken from me because uh, I didn't have them, so I couldn't get injured. But he got his hands on the hatchet, and he learned the hard way. But our parents, as much as sometimes we can be frustrated, our parents are much like, like God. They have our best interest in mind. We don't always think so. We struggle sometimes to understand it. We think it's... It's just rules and trying to keep us from having fun. But they truly want to protect us because they know what can happen. And so I wanted to bring you that little story. But there's one thing that wasn't funny in the end. Mike, my friend I was talking about, this is all the way up to just a couple years ago now, so, you know, we're all grown people. He had a little boating weekend with, uh, with a few of us from the church. We were out on his boat, and um, I forgot how the conversation came up, but he had just preached the sermon that day talking about his hatchet story. And um, so we were on the boat cruising around, and, and some topic came up. And I said, you know, guys, I said, Mike, he's a guy of integrity. When he says, hey, let's just bury the hatchet on this, he really means it, <laughs> since he actually buried the hatchet in his, in his shin bone. I don't remember him laughing when I said that, but it was kind of funny to me at the time. But anyway, I wanted to share that story with you to, as, a, as a way of us remembering that, although sometimes we can't have some things, sometimes it's in our best interest and we should maybe smile upon it, knowing that later we're going to be wiser and, and maybe healthier for that. Okay? All right. Well, thank you all for listening so patiently. I'll let you go back to your seats now if you like. Thank you.
Good morning, family. Happy Sabbath. It's so good to come and worship on this beautiful Sabbath morning with the beloved members here. And on our, even on the internet you are watching, welcome everyone. And welcome for potluck today. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? May the Lord bless us as Pastor G bring us the message, open our hearts and minds to receive his blessing this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, church family. How are y'all doing today? You doing okay? Not too bad? Well, it has been a busy week. No doubt that my in-laws, you've probably noticed, uh, we're alone today. And so thank you so much for the ladies for helping us with the kids. But it's different having an empty house. Boy, I tell you what, um, when we're all on our own, it's definitely unique. So y'all saw in the news about a week ago and since then, um, something has happened here in the United States. That uh, a certain leak has taken place, and it's the talk of the town. Have you seen this? Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about, anybody here? Does anyone know, not know what I'm talking about? Okay, with the Supreme Court leak. Okay, it's fascinating, really. You think about it. First time that there's something along these lines has taken place in such a dramatic way, and what a splash it has made in the political world and in the news channels all over social media. I don't know if it's been a conversation in your home or not, but it is something that is on a lot of people's minds, and in fact. Um, people are already acting according to this uh, potential change in policy. And so, if you don't know, the Supreme Court, there was a leak saying that they're going to reverse Roe versus Wade. And I'm not here to talk about that in, in, in a sense, but they are uh, looking at potentially changing this, right? It's not law yet, but some states are acting as if it is law already. Oklahoma, for example, they have already acted on the potential ruling by forbidding abortions after six weeks of conception. Okay, so they're already acting in policy and in law based on what a potential ruling will be. Okay, and so this morning I want to I want to look at a I want to look at the cosmic court case that is pending that you and I can be confident of what the verdict will be. Okay. So that way you and I today can start to change the way that we live, the policies, so to speak, that, uh, that control our life and what, how we live. Because I believe that if we know what the, the verdict will be, our actions should change. And also the hope that each and every one of us have internally should change as well. And so let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into the Bible. We're going to do... A little bit of exercise here. I don't have it here on the, on the screen, so if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be spending some time in uh, Daniel, Revelation, and Zechariah. So please bow your heads with me for an additional word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for the privilege that it is to be able to come together today to be able to worship you. And God, we want to ask that you would please open up our eyes and our hearts to be able to see your beauty and your majesty and the promise that you give to each and every one of us here today. And I ask, Lord, that as we we study this, that it would bring um, freedom to us, and it would also change the way in which we we live. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Last time I was here with y'all, we talked about, it was Passover weekend, Easter weekend. So do you remember what we talked about? Does anyone here remember? Okay, I'm going to test your, your knowledge, Bible students, okay? What did we talk about? The, the sermon's title was, Do You See the Value? Does that ring a bell? 
Does anyone pay? All right, all right. So now I'm, I'm, I'm recording this, all right, so don't worry. Um, yes, sir. Somebody was going to buy something. Do you remember this? That's right. Okay, so out of the mouth of babes, right? Thank you very much. Elon Musk saw an incredible value in Twitter. He's willing to dump $43 billion, $44 billion. We looked at what that really is. And then we apply that understanding to when we say Jesus died for us. Do we really understand the value of what was paid in order to redeem us? And then we see who Jesus really is and the, the, the complexity of what he gave up and the majesty from where he left to humble himself to come and redeem us. What an incredible value that is on each and every one of us here today. Jesus sees that value, and if he's willing to pay that price, how much more is he able to empower you to live the life that he's called you to live? With him, every gift from heaven will be given to us. That's what we looked at, and we said, I want to be covered with the blood of the Lamb to be made sure that I am living by faith and the promise that he has made for us. Well, today, there's a topic that we've been studying on and off again. It's come up a few times in our uh, Bible prophecy class. We do have a Daniel class, and it meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 6 o'clock. Everyone's welcome to come and join on that, uh, even if you haven't been to it yet. It's a, it's a fantastic time. We're able to go slow and study the Bible. But one of the topics that comes up is judgment. Now, When I say the word judgment, who here says, oh, I don't really like, I'm kind of worried about judgment, maybe, okay? Don't raise your hands, right? But if you've ever worried uh, about judgment and how that will play out, kind of the idea of having to stand in the judgment, what is that really going to look like? Um, Am I good enough, right? Does Jesus really accept me? Am I going to pass the test, essentially? These are a lot of questions that sometimes we wrestle with. And even if we don't verbalize them, these are some things that sometimes we have an insecurity about. Can I be sure of my salvation? Can I be sure that I will be accepted? Can I be sure that I will not have to stand in such a way that I will feel embarrassed before God? Brothers and sisters, there are two parts to judgment. We're going to look at one of them today that I believe is good news. This is really good news because it's something that you and I, by faith, do not have to stand in. Let's get a good overview of what this is. So turn with me in the book of Daniel. We're going to go to the prophet Daniel. We're going to go to chapter 7 to get an an idea of what this judgment scene looks like. Okay? So Daniel, which chapter? Chapter 7. That's right. So Daniel chapter 7. When you get there, say amen. All right. If you need some more time, say, have mercy. All right, sounds like you're all there. Okay, Gary needs some mercy. There you go. So Daniel chapter 7 and then Revelation chapter 20, they give a good picture of this final judgment scene. But Daniel 7, starting in verse 9, we'll read verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Now, brothers and sisters, that sounds like a serious situation. This sounds like a very serious scene. In my eyes, when I think about this, I try to visualize what's going on here. This seems very sobering, all right? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, and we'll get an idea of what chapter 20 gives on the same event. It gives a little bit of a different description, so that way we can kind of see all sides to this, okay? So Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to start in verse 11. And this is what it says. Chapter 20, starting in verse 11. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. 
and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades were delivered up, uh, excuse me, delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here, Daniel and, Re- and John, the revelator, they're both depicting the same scene. But yet we have a few different elements from each one of them, okay? Now, some things to note off the top. This is a very serious moment. I imagine that those who are standing before God in this whole scene, God Almighty, and they're seeing this, and the books are open, and they're they're about to be judged according to the works. Can you imagine? I feel like you can hear a pin drop in this kind of a situation. This is a very serious thing. And imagine having yourself, I don't know about you, but I have wondered, what would it be like if I were to be standing there in this moment? How would I feel? Would I be excited? Probably not. Would I be worried? Definitely knowing that I know who, what I have done in my life, okay? And I don't know about you, but if there's things in your life that you're not proud of, this kind of a moment, this judgment seems, seems kind of scary, no doubt. And it should be scary in this moment. But let me ask you this. Is there good news here today in the house of God? There is, right? And so this is a, a scene that I don't think that any one of us here needs to stand in. This is a scene that none of us here have to experience firsthand being on the receiving end of this uh, this language that we find here in Daniel and Revelation. Okay? The book of John gives us a... a, Because remember, there's two parts to judgment. We're looking at the second part this morning. Okay? Next time I'm with you, we're going to spend more time looking at the first part of judgment. Now, the second part, this final scene here, is one that I think that you and I don't have to enter into. Let's see why. John chapter 5, turn with me to the book of John, chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 24. And here Jesus is giving us some good news. John chapter 5, starting in verse 24, or reading verse 24. And this is what it says. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has what? Has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Let's break this text down just a little bit, okay? Anyone here, I know, I know there's a few people here that are really good with grammar, okay? Anyone here really good with grammar? All right, go ahead, don't be shy, raise your hand. All right, so I, I'm going to put my hand down because I'm not really good with grammar, all right? You know, in seventh grade, I was able to leave the special, not the special ed, but special learning class because I didn't, I, reading comprehension was not my gift. Uh, you asked me how to spell squirrel, uh, I'm sorry, but it's not going to happen very easily, right? Uh, spell check is my best friend. I'm not very good with grammar, but I think there's some simple things that we know, we all can agree on in the English language with grammar that will give us some clues to what's going on here in verse 24. It says, Jesus is speaking in the present tense. He says, I, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has what? Has everlasting life. Now, when it says has everlasting life, what tense is that? That's present tense. Exactly. Not that you will have everlasting life, but you have everlasting life. We'll, we'll break that down a little bit because we know that Jesus comes back with the reward, right? But here he's saying that we have everlasting life if we have faith and believe in him who has sent Jesus and also in the words of Christ. And then he says, in the second half, he says, and shall not come into judgment. What tense is that? Is that past tense, present tense, or future tense? That's future tense, right? shall not come into judgment, all right? So if you believe in the words of Christ and you believe on him who sent him, you have presently everlasting life. And if you have presently everlasting life through faith, 
righteousness by faith, then in the future you shall not come into judgment. Because what, is, what happened? It says, but has, you have passed from death into life. Now this is good news, guys. This is really good news. Because when I first read this, and I'm thinking about this final judgment scene, and worried because I know that I'm not a perfect man. I know that the things that I've done in my life that I'm not proud of. I know that there are things that I, I wish would never see the light of day. And to, to, to have this idea that I'm going to stand there before God, the books of my life will be opened, and they're going to be reading every single thing that I've done. This is not a good situation. There's nothing about that that gives me confidence about me standing up and saying, hey, listen, I'm good enough because I know my life's record, right? And if there's one bad thing on that list, which I've got more than one, I promise, if there's more than one bad thing in that list, then I'm not good enough for heaven. Again, remember last time I was here, what did we preach on? The value that Jesus sees in you, the price paid to redeem you, okay? So this is in that context. This conversation this morning is in the context of what we spoke on last time. But Jesus says, by faith, we can pass through judgment. We can pass through it from death unto life. By faith, we can have everlasting life today. The assurance of salvation, brothers and sisters, that you don't have to walk away from here today being afraid, does God really love me? Is God really going to redeem me? Okay? Not saying once saved, always saved, but as long as you stay in that saving relationship with Jesus, in that relationship, growing with him, walking with him, you know your friend, you know you're spending time together, and you know that he has got your back. We can know that today. So this final judgment scene, it can be very scary. And I think that for those who do not have faith in Jesus and do not really claim his promises, they will have to stand in this moment without an advocate, without an intercessor, because Jesus came to be everything for us. He came to be the sacrifice. He also came to be the redeemer. And he's also our advocate, or our, um, like in Spanish, it's abogado, which is the lawyer, okay? He came to be our defender. And he comes in the presence of the Father with his blood saying that, hey, I know Michael. Michael has faith in my sacrifice, and this is my blood, my righteous sacrifice to cover him and his sins. And in that moment, I am seen as if I had never done anything wrong because the blood of Jesus washes away my sins. Turn with me to our opening text this morning to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah is interesting because in the book of Zechariah, he's got a, a series of visions with all different meanings. But in chapter 3, we see a court scene. We see this, this, this judgment court scene taking place. And this is something that is beautiful. So Zechariah chapter 3, we'll read the first couple of verses here. And it's starting in verse 1. This is what it says. And then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and he spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. So here we find this judgment scene. Joshua, the high priest, is the representative of Israel. And what kind of robes does he have on? Filthy robes, right? Now, if you look in Exodus chapter 28, it gives a huge breakdown of all the things that the high priest was supposed to wear all the meanings. And to have a filthy garment was, an, it was a symbolic for having iniquity in his life or the sin of Israel. And so the high priest could not be standing there with these dirty robes on. And Satan is here in this court scene that we read about in Zechariah. And Satan's like, hey, God, look, your guy, the high priest, 
He's got filthy garments on. Now let me ask you this. Was Satan lying or was Satan telling the truth? Was he lying? No. Joshua had dirty clothes on. Was Joshua guilty? Yes or no? Yes. Joshua was guilty. He's standing right there for all to see, plain as day, in his filthy garments. There was no denying the fact he had dirty garments on. But what does the, the judge step in here, the angel of the Lord God, what does he step in and what does he do? Does he say, you know what, Satan? You're absolutely right. Sorry, Joshua. Is that what he says? No. In fact, he doesn't even parlay with Satan. He just says, be quiet. I have redeemed Joshua. He's a brand plucked from the fire. And then he goes, not just to leave Joshua in his state of sin, but he says, I'm going to take away your dirty garments and I will supply these clean garments to you. I have taken away your iniquity from you and now I'm going to supply these, this clean character to you. All right? Because clothing in the Bible represents character. And so what does Joshua do in this whole ordeal? What is he doing? Nothing. He simply stands there and he trusts the work of the advocate. By the way, the judge here is the advocate. You notice that? That's just really good news. By the way, did you know that Jesus is the judge? Did you know that? So if the judge died to save you and redeem you, is that pretty good news? Do you have like some, are you, is someone pulling some strings for you behind the back, you know, behind the scenes, right? Guys, we ha- this is really good news, okay? So this morning when we're talking about judgment and it seems really scary, it is if you don't have Jesus. But if you have Jesus, you have nothing to fear. I mean, think about this for a moment. This should change the way that we live our life. When you sit down and you read the Bible, this should change the way that you interact with the promises of God. This should change the way that we pray. When we go over to our neighbor's house and we want to share uh, Jesus with our neighbor, guys, we have great news to share. That Jesus is ready to pull out all the stops to redeem us completely. Not just a little bit, not just halfway and then you got to do the rest. No, he wants to do the entire thing. And all I got to do is join him on the party. This is really good news. I ought to say that it's a party, but you get the idea, right? This is a, uh, something that we should celebrate what God does for us. And Joshua, though he was guilty, I am guilty too. But I have a good judge, and so do you, who is ready to take that dirty clothes off of you and to supply you. He, notice the judge didn't go to say to Joshua, all right, Joshua, pull out that tide marker, you know, get, get working, get scrubbing, you know, you got 30 minutes, right? See what you can do. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm going to take away that dirty clothes from you, and then you need to go and, you know, get you a little lamb and, you know, start spinning the wool and dye it and, and make your own garment again. He didn't say that either, did he? In fact, he didn't even say, go out and buy a garment from this new store. He didn't say that either. What did he do? He provided it. The judge, the angel of the Lord, Jesus here, is, takes away the dirty one, and then he provides something to Joshua that Joshua could not produce on his own. Think about that for a moment. When you look at in the mirror and you see, oh man, I have made so many mistakes in my life. I've done so many wrong things. How can God ever love me? How can God ever remake me? How can God ever uh, restore me to, to the where he wants me to be? Remember, he is not asking you to use material that you have. He is going to provide you with something that you do not have. That's why we need him. He is able to do the impossible in our life. Let's go back to the book of Revelation, because there's something interesting here. Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation, starting in chapter 2, we see a, um, it's through verse th- chapter 3, we see a series of letters that go out to the different angels or the different elders of these churches, okay? And so 
the first one is the, 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 the church of Ephesus, is the loveless church. But here we're going to read in the beginning of chapter 3, in verse 1, the dead church. And there's a specific message that's given to the dead church that I think is really interesting because there's something in it that highlights an experience that you and I can have, okay? So, again, this is going to feel maybe a little exhaustive, but I think that covering the text helps us to understand the picture better. Uh, starting in verse 1, And to the angel uh, of, the church, or, uh, yeah, of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. By the way, that's Jesus speaking here, okay? I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are already to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know the, at what hour I will come upon you. You, and you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not done what? Defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So there's a few points here to, re to remember. Again, here we find the idea about garments being defiled. And those who do not have defiled garments are walking in white. They should be walking with Jesus, which is really good news. And then it says something really interesting. Notice here in the middle of verse 5, towards the, yeah, the middle of verse 5. And it says that he, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Now, let me ask you this. If he is not going to blot out your name from the book of life, what does that mean? Where is your name? It's in the book of life. When? Now or later? Now. Your name is currently written in the book of life. This isn't something that you're trying to hopefully make it onto the list one day. Your name's already there. The question is, what will be blotted out? our sins, the record of our sins, or our name from the book of life. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I know which one I want to make sure that I have blotted out, okay? How do we have our sins blotted out, you may ask, okay? And how do we have this overcoming experience? Because verse 5 sounds like, man, I don't know, but when I make promises to God, man, I kind of I break those promises. My promises aren't very strong, uh, the book Steps to Christ refers to those promises as ropes of sand. And I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard to tie something with sand. It just doesn't work. So whose promises do I rely upon? Mine or God's? I rely upon God's promises. Let's look to see how we get these white robes, okay? Turn with me just a few chapters over to chapter 7. Now this is in the context of the, uh, the 144,000 and coming through this great tribulation, we learn of an experience that they have and how do they wash their robes that I believe that any one of us today can have that same exact experience. We're going to read verses 13 and 14, and this is what it says in chapter 7 of Revelation, chapter thir uh, verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And so he said to me, these are the ones that come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in what? The blood of the Lamb. They made them white and, and they washed them in the blood of the Lamb. Guys, look at this. How do we get our hands? I mean, I don't know. Um, stores right now are having a hard time with uh, all kinds of different supplies, supply chain issues. But I promise you one thing. Today, in the storehouse of heaven, there is not a supply chain issue in, with, the, with the tied pods of Jesus' blood. Okay? You can go there today and find what you need to redeem you and to wash you in your, of your sins, to cleanse your record. 
So that way when the father sees you, what does he see? He sees the spotless robe of his son covering you. Now he sees you as if you had never sinned in your life with no, no, nothing that you have to be ashamed of, nothing that you have to worry, is this not taken care of? Guys, Jesus' blood can blot out every kind of stain that you and I are able to make. That's the whole point. Remember last time when we talked about the, the value of what has been paid to redeem us, we're talking about the precious blood of Jesus, the creator, the great I am. He is the one who came to die to redeem you. There is nothing in your record that he cannot wash. And there is nothing in your future that he cannot help you to give you the strength to overcome through him. Galatians 2.20 says that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now, brothers and sisters, when you go to fight your battles, who are you wanting to fight? Do you want to fight it in your own strength, or do you want to have Jesus fight those battles for you? By faith, we can take hold of Jesus and say, Lord, I want you in my life completely. God, forgive me, for I am a sinner. I have done wrong here in my life, and I need you and you alone to wash me, to empower me, to enable me to live the life that you've called me to live. Philippians 2, 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's not you pulling your life up by the bootstraps. It's not me going to the cross and saying, Lord, please forgive me of my sins and thank you for that. And now everything else is up to me. That's not it either. It's by faith each day taking a step saying, Lord, I am not able, but you are. And thank you so much for being an able and willing Savior. Lead me today. When you think about your neighbor, when you think about your brother, your sister, those who you love who do not have a saving relationship with Jesus, say, Lord, I want to talk to them, but this is your conversation, and I ask that you would speak through me. Lord, provide me an opportunity to lift them up, to show the beauty of your character, that they may too also taste and see that the Lord is good. Guys, God is able to do everything. When you think about this great challenge that we have sometimes in our life with personal sins or addictions that we may face personally, and also corporately, how do we help our church to grow? How do we help our community to see Jesus and his beauty and to recognize that he's coming back soon? What can I do? It feels overwhelming. Guys, you serve a God who has got big, strong arms. He is able to do anything and everything. And the day is coming, brothers and sisters, when the Spirit is going to be poured out in such a way that we're going to see this world turned upside down again. Let's make sure that our hearts are primed and ready for this. And the idea of a, of a, of a court case. Oftentimes, when you're having a, uh, a court case, there has to be evidence. Evidence in order to, to prove something, right? To make the case. Who is going to win the case? The devil always comes with the best evidence. Because... I don't know about you, but I know that I'm guilty. I know I've done stuff, okay? And so he's going to come with those things and that record. He's going to say, hey, see Joshua right here? He's got dirty clothes on. See Michael right here? These are the things that he's done. And if you line it up with the record in heaven, it'll match, okay? So there's no denying that. But guys, there is an evidence on the other side of the court. There is evidence that Jesus, for one, has loved you with an unmeasurable amount of love, who's paid the price to redeem you. The question that I have for me today, and I would ask the same thing for you, is there evidence in your heart to convict you of being a disciple of Jesus? It's not that you have to save yourself by works, but am I entering into that relationship? Am I spending time talking to God? Am I spending time learning about God and his word? Am I spending time thinking about him? Or am I more spending more time on Netflix? Okay? The church has ears, let them hear, right? Some years ago, this story, um, this story, the one that I'm going to share this morning, I'm not sure if all the details are 100%, but the one that happened most recently in Malaysia in 2020 doesn't quite fit the illustration, but this one does a, a little bit better. 
Some years ago down in South Florida, there was a little boy named Johnny who went shopping with his mom. And Johnny went shopping at the grocery store with his mom, and it was a hot summer day. If you've ever been down south, you know how hot and humid it can be. And this little boy gets home, and they live in a great spot down there, because in their backyard, they share like a, a big giant common pond with uh, some of their other neighbors. And it's kind of like farmish land, so they got space. Well, little Johnny brings in the groceries, drops them down on the kitchen floor, and his mom starts putting things away, and Johnny's already pulling off his shirt and throwing on his swim trunks, and his shoes are off, and he's bolted out the back door, uh, slammed the screen door open, and he's, he's charging out towards the pond in the backyard. He's, he's thinking of all he can think about is that nice, refreshing, cool water that he's about to go jump into. And he's so excited. And so that's the one thing that's on his mind. Well, Johnny's mom is, is also happy that he's having a good time. And so she looks out there on the pond, and she noticed something floating out there. And not only was it floating, it was swimming. And she realized immediately what it was. It was an alligator. That alligator was swimming from the middle of the, of the pond towards where Johnny was about to jump off the bank into the water. And before she could drop everything and run out the door to scream his name, Johnny was already taking his last step off the dock and diving right into that nice, cool, refreshing lake pond. And he starts to swim out there, all the while that alligator is swimming right towards him. And Johnny's mom busts out the back door, and she's screaming, Johnny, 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 Johnny. And Johnny doesn't know what she's screaming about, but he can hear it in her voice that something very serious is taking place. So immediately he turns around, and he starts swimming back to shore to where his mom is. And Johnny's mom is, is racing. The alligator is racing. Johnny is racing. Johnny doesn't really know what's going on. Poor Johnny. But he gets up to the dock at the same time that his mother comes there to grab his hands, at the same time the alligator comes and grabs his legs. And there we see this great tug of war taking place between a mother, the alligator, and the son in the middle. And she's screaming and she's fighting. And that alligator is shaking and twisting. It's not a giant alligator, but it's definitely doing its work. And as this was happening, it just so happened that a, a farmer was driving by in his nice F-150, had his windows down, enjoying the nice day, and he heard the commotion, he saw what was going on, ran over there with his shotgun, and he shot the alligator dead. Johnny, three weeks later, in the hospital, he'd had a, a serious round of antibiotics and some surgeries and you name it. A reporter from the local news station was there talking with Johnny, saying, Johnny, your, your, your legs got all these scars on them. What was it like being in the mouth of the alligator? And Johnny's telling that a little bit. And the news reporter says, Johnny, you're, you don't really appreciate this right now, but when you get to college, you'll be able to share the story about all these scars that you got on your legs, and it's, it's going to be, you're going to have quite the story to share. And Johnny says, you know what? It is cool that I'm going to have those scars, but the scars that I'm the most proud of are the ones that are on my arms. Because those are the ones that give me evidence that my mom would never let me go. Today, brothers and sisters, those scars remain. The scars on the hands and feet of Jesus remain to be an evidence that he loves you and he will not let you go. When you think about the things of judgment in this Bible, when we think about the end, end time scenes, do not be afraid. Jesus will not let you go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much that you love us so much and that you won't let us go, Jesus. You can't forget about us. Anything that we're going through, whether it's being us personally or in our family or with our friends, Jesus, we are the apple of your eye and thank you so much that you see us. And God, we want to take faith today and know that we can stand confident today knowing that Jesus your blood washes us of our sins. God, we admit we're sinners. We need you. We need your salvation. We need the power of your blood in our life to cleanse us, to recreate us, and to make us into new people. We ask that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit to change the way that we do life. Help us, Jesus, today to be able to walk away from here knowing that in your eyes we do have eternal life. I ask, Jesus that you would make us a people that are ready for you, and that, Jesus, you would also give us divine opportunities this week to be able to share your good news with those whom we love. And as we read your word this week, I ask that you would jump out to us, Jesus. 
Renew that first love relationship with us. And give us the joy of thy salvation. For we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So next week, not next week, but the week after, next time I'm here, we're going to look at the other aspect of judgment, one that I don't think we have to be afraid of because we know the good news of who our judge is. Our closing song is 475. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that there is a balm in Gilead. And I ask that that healing balm would be applied to our lives and to our hearts. Look into our hearts, Lord. Search and try and see if there's anything inside of us that you want to change. And God, you also know the struggles that we're facing. And I ask that your hand of healing power would be upon us. And that, Jesus, you would bring back to us the joy of your salvation. That we would be able to walk in its liberty. And thank you so much for your promises. And Father, now we ask that you would bless this food that we're about to partake in, the time that we have together in fellowship. And I ask that you would watch over us this week, that you would keep us safe, Lord. And I thank you so much for the kindness that you've shown towards us and the promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. For we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.